Today, we are so fortunate to be joined by a panel of incredible education leaders to discuss this really critical issue facing charter schools and public education in general, which is how to recruit, support, and retain teachers of color. Uh, as the student population in the United States grows ever more diverse, the teacher workforce has not kept pace, but charter schools do offer some bright spots as we think about how to build a teacher workforce that reflects the diversity of our students. So to start us off today, we are honored to be joined by Roberto Rodriguez. He currently serves as Assistant Secretary for Planning, Evaluation, and Policy Development at the U.S. Department of Education. He has a long history of public service, including roles in the White House and the U.S. Senate. And most recently, he served as President and CEO of Teach Plus, which is an organization focused on teacher leadership and voice. So today, Assistant Secretary Rodriguez will be speaking with us about the Department of Education's priorities around teacher diversity. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Assistant Secretary. Thank you so much, Fiona. It's a thrill to be with you uh, and such a pleasure to join uh, the Alliance uh, for this important conversation. I want to thank um, you and uh, all of the leadership at the Alliance for making space today to kick off this discussion uh, and to helping to inform the field around the importance of recruiting, uh, developing, supporting, and retaining our diverse educators. You have a really remarkable panel that you're going to hear from shortly uh, about this work. Um, thank you for inviting me to provide a few framing remarks. Um, you know, I just think that it's a, what we're talking about today, uh, how can we do better and up our game, uh, make the systemic changes and marshal the will that we need to support a diverse teaching workforce uh, in our public charter schools. Um, it is such an important topic. And ultimately our collective will and resolve to meet this challenge is the gift that we are going to give to the next generation of learners uh, for the future vibrancy of our democracy, right? We need to create those windows and mirrors for our diverse learners to succeed and to thrive in our schools. We need to provide that opportunity for our schools to uh, reflect the great diversity of our country. And we need to do that in a way that measures to the commitment of a well-prepared teacher in every classroom as the single most fa important factor that we know research tells us is so important for our student success. So, you know, we uh, I, I've both studied this issue over the course of my time as a, as a policymaker uh, and as a nonprofit leader, uh, as you mentioned, Fiona, when I was at Teach Plus. Uh, I also have just a deep personal connection to the work. Having grown up in the Midwest, it wasn't until high school that I actually had those mirrors, that Latino teacher for me that invested in my success and really helped uh, me see my future. Um, so it's the story for far too many of our young people. And I, I really believe we have to do better as a country here. Um, you know, when uh, we were doing work at Teach Plus, we partnered with the Education Trust to do uh, a report and a study called If You Listen, We Will Stay. Uh, and that study was really a wake up call to the make or break conditions that we have in our schools that contribute whether to, to whether our talented teachers of color have the opportunity to grow and thrive in the profession uh, or whether uh, we're going to take us back, right? Whether um, that is a learning condition and environment that doesn't um, recognize them and support their success. So we have to do better to get to that mismatch between our student population and our students of our students population and our teachers of color we know that uh, our public charter schools have made great strides in terms of helping to support uh, more diverse teachers which is a great which is great news we know from the work on if you listen we will stay we also have work to do around building a uh, culture and climate that affirms all of our teachers and helps them stay in the classroom. For our teachers of color, that means they need a climate that mirrors their identity and that supports their identity as an exceptional teacher of color. Uh, we know that that's a tremendous asset for their growth, uh, the opportunity for them to learn from uh, other mentors um, who've walked um, similar paths and who may teach in similar conditions and face similar um, circumstances and challenges relative to being a, a diverse teacher uh, in the profession. Uh, we know that uh, the relevance of our clinical experience 
And those early and that mentorship early in a teacher's career matters greatly. It matters even more for our teachers of color. Uh, and of course, we need to make sure that we're putting an end to the invisible tax that our teachers of color too often pay in their buildings as they're being tapped to monitor lunchrooms or to uh, get engaged in discipline incidents in their schools or to translate that document or work those extra hours, sometimes at the expense of their own professional development and learning. We have to do better to uh, end those practices and to be more attuned uh, to supporting the learning and growth and professional success of our teachers of color after they reach the classroom. Um, so our our work here um, is, is uh, urgent as ever. As I said, I really feel like the, and I wanna applaud the steps that uh, many in our public charter community have taken to intentionally approach this space and to make strides in, uh, in increasing our, the number of our teachers of color. I had a chance uh, to sit down um, last year with the National Fellowship for Black and Latino Male Educators, which was comprised of a number of uh, charter educators, and their stories were all inspiring to me. They all connected back to so much of what I learned through the work around If You Listen, We Will Stay, and to other conversations and connections that I've made with educators around the country uh, in terms of some of the challenges that they face, but also uh, in terms of the affirmation and the support that they bring to one another as a community. This work around building building community and building fellowship is so important to this uh, greater charge around building and supporting a diverse workforce. So we are carrying this commitment through here at the US Department of Education. We have a comprehensive policy agenda to develop and support a racially culturally and linguistically diverse and well-prepared educator workforce and to creating a workforce that and an education workforce that is a profession that is attractive and viable and and uh, and that folks from all backgrounds can pursue. So that's encapsulated in uh, Secretary Cardona's broader Raise the Bar, Lead the World initiative and we are uh, employing a research-based strategy uh, to strengthen and diversify our education profession. Our secretary often calls this the ABCs for educators. It's agency to make better decisions around what's right for their students. It's B, better working conditions, better conditions for those teachers to thrive and to grow. And C, it's making sure that they have the competitive salaries that they'll need to be able to um, uh, earn an effective living and to, and to uh, continue to grow in their profession. Um, we know that our teachers uh, in general are uh, paid at about 24% less than comparable other college graduates. Um, that tax uh, on, um, on teaching is even more pronounced uh, and felt even more for many of our teachers of color and our teachers in low-income communities. So we're seeing progress in red states and in blue states to try to tackle this salary challenge. Since 2021, um, two, 29 states in D.C. have taken concrete steps to increase teacher salaries. We think that that's a great direction to go in, in addition to making some of the other big changes that we need in the profession. Uh, we've tried to do more to double down on programs like public service loan forgiveness uh, and implement that program better um, to be able to provide. And just over the last two years, we've been able to disperse $24 billion in, uh, in forgiveness for loans to over 360,000 public servants, many of them teachers. We're also undertaking specific grant programs that will help to support diversifying the profession. Uh, the pinnacle of that is the Augustus Hawkins program, uh, where we're investing now tens of millions of dollars to attract and develop and build a talent pipeline uh, for our teachers of color at our HBCUs, our historically black colleges and universities, at our HSIs, our Hispanic serving institutions, our tribally, our tribally controlled colleges and universities, our TCCUs, our anapesi institutions. Um, these institutions together prepare half 
of all of our nation's teachers of color. So we want to double down on the strategies for those institutions to grow those pipelines, while also thinking about what other alternate pathways can we support into the profession. One of those exciting pathways we've been working to support at the federal level in partnership with our colleagues at the Department of Labor is uh, the teacher apprenticeship model, which is fashioned after a lot of the grow your own uh, work that's been done around the country. At the start of 2022, we had just two states that had registered teacher apprenticeships. Today, we have over 24 states. Uh, that have put in place the conditions and registered their programs with the Department of Labor to maintain high standards for quality and to support teachers in a grow, uh, in a learn and earn model, where essentially teachers are being brought in and are being supported, learning alongside uh, mentors and peers, uh, and uh, don't necessarily have to face the big uh, price barrier that other teachers might have to face relative to beginning in the profession. That's also a tremendously important uh, source of talent for other school personnel, paraprofessionals, other support personnel inside and outside of school to really call them to think about uh, becoming a full-time teacher. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention the career advancement and leadership structures and opportunities that we are uh, looking to grow and promote for educators. We know that uh, our uh, our generation today, looking at the uh, field of teaching, is looking for more of an opportunity to lead beyond the four walls of their classroom, to be able to sit and distribute that leadership with their principal in ways where they're shaping curriculum, shaping instructional plans and lessons, shaping school culture and climate, and shaping professional learning and professional advancement, uh, professional development for other teachers in the classroom. So we want to provide greater opportunities, more formal roles for our teachers to serve as instructional coaches and mentors, to, uh, to be able to serve as teacher leaders in their building, uh, more opportunities to restructure our schools in more innovative ways so that our, uh, our principals have the professional development and training and coaching to distribute their leadership with some of their exceptional uh, teachers. I've seen firsthand how powerful a model that is in the work that I've led at Teach Plus, and I've seen that in place in so many wonderfully high-performing charter schools around the country. Uh, I'm very excited about the opportunity for us here at the federal level to continue to support and grow that model. Um, just in closing, let me say that, you know, it is gonna take all of us a collective effort to be able to meet this charge. Um, we need to do more to connect the research-based practices and the evidence with the uh, practice in the field um, to help build and support those models of excellence for more of our schools and more of our school leaders to adopt and to marshal the will uh, as policymakers here at the federal level, but also at the, at the local level in your communities, whether it's in your CMOs or at your school at the helm of your schools to build more of an opportunity to prioritize recruitment and retention uh, of, of our diverse teachers. Um, with that, we know that our students will thrive, all of our students will thrive, but we have to be intentional about building that opportunity. We have to be intentional about investing those resources in supporting uh, recruiting and growing and then developing uh, a thriving, uh, and successful diverse teaching workforce. So thanks so much for the chance to be with you today. Uh, I really enjoy that. I enjoyed the chance and I'm so thrilled that you're having this conversation. Uh, and without and further ado, I'll turn it back over to you, Fiona, for our panel. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Rodriguez, for those comments, and we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. It's really heartening to know that the Department of Education is prioritizing educator diversity and that charter schools can play a role in that. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thanks. Um, and now we're going to dive in with our panel to learn more about what this means for charter schools. Um, as I'm sure everyone listening right now knows, we're at a really challenging time for the teaching profession and education in general. 
And as we continue to work to recover from the impacts of the pandemic, we're also facing teacher shortages and other challenges. But there is some evidence that charter schools are creating environments that support their teachers, especially their teachers of color. In charter schools, for example, 31% of teachers nationwide are people of color compared to just 19% in district operated school and 33% of charter school leaders are people of color compared to 22% in district schools. And similarly, a recent report from our friends at the Fordham Institute looked at charter schools in North Carolina and found that black students in charter schools were about 50% more likely to have a black teacher and that proportionally charter schools employ about 35% more black teachers than district operated schools in North Carolina. And this is a really big deal for the charter school community because together black and Hispanic students account for more than 60% of all charter school students. And research shows um, and has continued to show over the years that having teachers that reflect their students' diversity has a really significant benefit for students, including by reducing the probability of students dropping out of high school. So with that all said, I'm so excited to introduce our panel of education leaders. First, we have Paula Cole. She is executive director of the Minnesota chapter of Educators for Excellence, which is an organization dedicated to elevating teacher voice. Next, we have Norma Garces, who is executive director of Academia Cesar Chavez, a bilingual charter school in St. Paul, Minnesota. And finally, we have Taylor Howard. She is Director of Professional Development at the Center for Black Educator Development, which is an organization that works to support and develop Black teachers. And I'm Fiona Sheridan McIver. I'm Director of Policy here at the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools. And I'm also a former educator and have taught in both charter and district public schools. So I'd like to start us off today by giving each of our panelists a chance to introduce themselves and their organizations. So could you each start with maybe the one minute story of your organization or school and how you came to be in your role? And uh, let's start with Paula. Thank you, Fiona, and greetings, everyone. I'm Paula Cole, I'm the Executive Director for Educators for Excellence Minnesota, as Fiona chaired. I'm also board chair of my local school board, where I've served for eight years. I'm a former teacher from Minneapolis Public Schools, uh, and that's where I became an Educators for Excellence member, because uh, we are an organization that is really focused on making sure that teachers' voices, opinions, and ideas are included at every step of the policy-making process for education. Oh, I'm on mute. Thank you, Paula. Uh, let's go to Norma next. I'm Norma Garces. I'm executive director of Academia Cesar Chavez in St. Paul. And I was also a Minneapolis public school teacher uh, for many years. And then I became executive director of El Colegio High School. Now I'm at Academia Cesar Chavez and is our bilingual dual immersion school in the heart of the east side of St. Paul. Thank you, Norma. And finally, Taylor. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I through my role at the Center for Black Educator Development and serving as a director of professional development, I came into this work after previously being a, an educator in a traditionally public school district in San Antonio, Texas, as well as then transferring into becoming um, a coach, behavior management, and serving um, the Baltimore region for Teach for America later on going to serve uh, in the human capital department for Baltimore City Public Schools and leading the and managing the teacher recruitment and um, hiring for the entire district before coming over to the center. So just excited to be in a space where it was great to be a part of recruiting people into this profession. And I think my heart was just deeply in ensuring that they were developed in a way that was sustainable and culturally proficient for our students. So that's why I love to do the work I do. Yeah, thank you everyone for those introductions. Um, as a reminder to everyone listening, um, you can put questions in the Q&A box and we will bring those to the panel at the end of our time together. And I want to just jump right in and start talking about how can we better support teachers at the classroom and school levels and how this can look different for teachers of color compared to white teachers. So my first question actually is for you, Taylor. Um, so I understand, as you mentioned, that you began your role as a teacher before transitioning to other roles outside of teaching that support teachers in their professional growth. So in your experience, both inside the classroom as a teacher and outside, uh, what do teachers of color need in terms of supports in their schools, professional development, et cetera, that is different from what white teachers need? 
Yeah, I think that part of what makes it important is humanizing this work. I think to think about a profession where our educational system was not designed for students of color traditionally, that these educators then decided to be in some ways revolutionary by being a part of a system and that wasn't originally designed for them or their learning experience, right? A system that wasn't designed for their cultural identities to be valued and seen as important in their learning experience. And so I think it's one important to humanize their experience as a student of color in their own previous K through 12 educational experience while recognizing that part of what brings them to this profession could be very personal for their work, right? Seeing that they understand the implications of what it means to have an education, not have an education in this uh, society. I, I also think, you know, secondly is recognizing that they experience the cultivation and fostering of students' cultural knowledge in a way that could be different than their white counterparts. And so it's really important to support them with the pedagogy that is necessary for ensuring that not only are the instructional practices something that's being honored, but that it's also being done through the cultural identities of their students in a way that doesn't allow their um, their own experiences to kind of assume what they need for their students of color. I think sometimes what we see from, from educators of color is this idea that I have the same experience as my students and therefore I know as opposed to helping them unpack what it could have meant for them as opposed to their students and so ensuring that um, they have that opportunity to differentiate as well. And, and I think lastly it's this idea of ensuring that their is equity in the way that they're, they're, the value that they bring to this profession is being seen different, right, than potentially their white counterparts and making sure that that's honored, whether that be through salary, whether that be through recognition of the things that they're doing, whether that be through the intersectionality of how that they, they bring in the community aspect into the everyday practices. I think that validation is really important um, to let them know as a, this is a way that we see you, we value you for who you are as a way of retaining them in this work. And it helps make that invisible tax that was talked about earlier, a little less cumbersome. Thank you for all that, Taylor. Now over to Norma. I know you have a very diverse staff at Academia Cesar Chavez, especially for a school in Minnesota. Um, according to a 2021 Minnesota Department of Education report, just 7% of teachers in Minnesota identify as people of color or indigenous. But at Academia Cesar Chavez, 86% uh, of elementary teachers are people of color and 60% in the middle school. So I'm curious if you can share a little bit about the practices at Cesar Chavez um, to recruit and retain so many teachers of color and how being a charter school helps make this possible? Um, that's a very loaded question with like, <laughs> I, well, I think our biggest, when we ask them how they end up at academia is a lot of it is a word of mouth, right? Like being genuine, like that we really care for the community or care for the community is genuine. We try to cut as much bureaucracy as possible. That is a huge um tax that our, our teachers are paid that you're asking us later, but is is that is a huge the bureaucracy that they have to go through with traditional districts or with with big, big charter schools. It is really hard for our community to navigate. They want more personalized interaction with with the executive director, with their their coaches, with their principals, their heads of school. So um that's one of the things that we're doing, like being genuine about what we're saying. We really like <laughs> giving them what, what we're saying that we're gonna do. Uh, we're also getting teachers who might not, since we're a bilingual school, I don't need the teachers to speak English proficiently. As long as they have the academic Spanish and they have they know how to teach in Spanish, we do the whole process for them, their licenses. So I have teachers who were 20 year teachers in Latin America, they're coming to work with us. And we, we don't, all the schools are centered into English again. So we're trying to, to center into Spanish. So then we have more people involved in our, in our community because they, there's no, 
no interpretation, no anything like that. Everybody who support speaks Spanish, everybody in the front office speaks Spanish, everybody in the administration office speaks Spanish and English. So when somebody who only speaks Spanish, but is a professional from their home country, we treat them equally, right? Like we just gotta make sure that we help them out. So a lot of that has helped they tell someone else, their colleagues somewhere else. Yeah. And it's really great to hear that you're supporting teachers and getting their licensure when they're coming from a different background mm -hmm. than a traditional teacher preparation, you know, in the state of Minnesota, for example. And in a few minutes, we're going to get to talking to Paola a little bit about the work that Ivory has done around teacher licensure in Minnesota. Um, but for right now, I'd like to go back to what both Secretary Rodriguez and Taylor just spoke about, which is this invisible tax or invisible labor that a lot of teachers of color encounter in their schools. And this can include anything from educating their coworkers to being the default contact person for families, leading cultural activities, mentoring students, being on call for discipline issues, and so much more. And none of these things are necessarily, or some of these things are not necessarily bad things, but it puts a tax on a teacher's time, which makes it harder for them to be successful in the long term and maintain their life balance. Um, so I guess I'll toss this over to either Taylor or Paula. Um, given the work that you've done in supporting teachers outside the classroom, what recommendations do you have for school leaders in this area? Um, maybe Taylor? Yeah, thanks, Fiona. I think one of the biggest things that when I'm going to do these professional developments, even with school leaders, is really helping them understand the difference between tokenism and valuing diversity, right? So when you think about what it really means to be culturally proficient, it means you're able to meet the needs of any student of any cultural background, not in spite of someone's cultural background, right? With any cultural background. And I think what happens is there's no big secret that that diversifying the educator workforce with teachers of color is something that almost everyone is trying to do, but you want to do it well. And you want to make sure that you're doing it in a way that retains them. And so this idea of tokenism of saying, well, we have this these, these teachers of color and they do X, Y, and Z at our school, it's an inflated sense of diversity. It's an inflated sense of inclusion, right? That really does more to marginalize those educators than it does to actually do the thing that I, I think you, they're attempting to do, which is to value diversity. In order to really value diversity, you have to first remove some positional power that a school leader has, right? You have to acknowledge the fact that you may not be the person who's values and or knowledge should be the determining factor when considering what decisions are being made for students and even staff and within your educational ecosystem, right? It means that you are thinking about who is the dominant culture within your school building, right? Whether that be through racial lens, ethnicity, et cetera, and you're bringing in those who don't reflect the dominant culture of those you're serving and saying, we want to hear from you about what your needs are, right? Because in any setting, the dominant culture's needs are going to get met. So if you're really trying to value diversity when it comes to your teachers of color, it's important to really elevate their voice and do something with it. Circle back, implement it, let it be seen that the things that they're expressing are something or things that are actually being done. The other thing is, is having a bar of accountability and saying to yourself, why am I asking them to do this thing? Right. Am I asking them to do it because their strengths naturally align? Are they doing it because they volunteered or am I doing it again for this idea to say, oh, well, they probably would be the best person for it because of, you know, they relate. And I think acknowledging some of those prefix mindsets that we come into when engaging with the teachers of color and asking ourselves some of those tougher questions before we go to them and start asking them to do, do certain things. Um, last thing I'll say on this too is when I talk to school leaders about this, you know, one of the things I overwhelmingly hear is, well, Taylor, you know, on one hand, I'm trying to ensure that they feel valued. And on the other hand, Sometimes I just feel as though, right, like I don't even know how to have that conversation. So I think part of what it is, too, is educate is school leaders ensuring they have the professional development they need or building their own competence and knowing how to have these conversations with their educators of color, right, in order to get to, to this point where you can say, yes, I spoke to them and they're doing this thing because of, you know, within their wheelhouse because they wanted to, not because I assumed that it was positionally best for them based on their own cultural identity. So I think that's a big gap that we're seeing in school leaders that a lot of people are hungry for that information and the center is eager to work with them to build that skill gap. 
Thanks for that, Taylor. And Norma, is there anything that you want to add there from your position as a school leader? I think I was just reflecting on all those things that, that, that Taylor was saying about leaders, because I think a lot of people also assume that because all, I'm a person of color, then, then all my teachers are Latinos, right? Like, or, or we have the same background. In the Latino community, there's no monolithic, like is they keep putting us in this box, but it's so diverse. So I have black teachers, I have African, um, um, we had an African teacher, we had, uh, we have, Latinos from all backgrounds, Afro Latinos, Caribeños, Mexicanos, Dominican. Like, I have, I think I have seven uh, countries from different backgrounds, and I have to still be alert of all those things that I'm assuming that as a leader, I'm assuming that they can do, or they should do, or that they want to do. Right? Like, like all of those biases, is regardless of who you are, you're in a different position now and you have to be alert of all those things. So I just wanna validate everything that Taylor is saying of, does it matter your background? I think people tend to assume, oh, that's for white people working with people of color. It doesn't matter your background. I can be doing the same things right here with everybody looking like me or in some kind of shade near to mine, but we do not think a lot, a, anything I like, right? Or that's not what they wanna do. And I think that's what we've been doing here very well in respecting teachers, teachers teach, support supports, right? Like that kind of stuff that where teachers, we don't overwhelm them with any of, of other that we keep out, like do this as a sign. <laughs> we try to limit that part. Yeah, that's a really, really important point. Thank you for sharing that. And then before we move on to our next topic, I want to throw out one more big one, which is that it's really hard to talk about supporting teachers without talking about teacher salaries. So I'd love to hear from a couple of you about what you would like to communicate to policymakers as you think about how to cultivate a stronger and more diverse teacher workforce. Um, and have you seen any innovative practices in charter schools to address this critical need for fair compensation for teachers? So maybe I'll kick this one to Paula. Thank you. Um, I have to say in the 11 years that E40 has been in town, uh, when teachers meet and talk about the things they need, the, the, the theme of salary is rarely touched because there's hopelessness. Mm -hmm. There's this feeling that if I, if I work about with, you know, on this, nothing's going to happen, uh, which is frustrating. Um, but ultimately, we are a teacher-led organization, so they pick the issue that they want to work on, and we help them get to in front of decision makers. So some of the things that our members have always supported are, you know, ways for differentiating compensation, uh, ways for uh, them to have leadership opportunities within their building so they can teach, but they can also have some opportunities learning to become coaches. Um, and... And as a former teacher myself, I have to say that right now, the level of education that a licensed teacher needs is so high. And when you are doing the math, you just can't afford to teach. I am one of those people. I couldn't afford being a teacher. So after year seven, I had to get out. Um, so it's definitely there. Uh, and then sadly, I don't see any any policy movement. I know that uh, our teacher unions are very vocal advocating for for increased salaries, uh, but then at the same time, there's some e other issues that come with it about retention and uh, you know who gets dismissed and why. And it just seems uh, like there's no way to go in. And unfortunately, the way that I see this going is that we are going, in, in addition to a teacher diversity problem, we have a teacher shortage problem. And we are not doing really anything or enough to stop it. And then we're going to end up like we have, and Norma, you will know this, there's a shortage of drivers, of bus drivers. Uh, there's a shortage of substitute teachers. And there's a lot related to also salary and and the and and all of the other issues that happen that don't help you feel satisfied in your job. Um, so I think instead of waiting for the shortage to be so 
low that we're basically saying anybody can come and be a teacher because we just need living, breathing people in front of kids. We need to do something now so that then we don't have to deal with the decline in, in learning and, and the effects that that will have in society later. Yeah. Thank you for that, Paula. And it's, it is disheartening to hear that this, and I'm also another former teacher who I wouldn't say I left exclusively because of salary, but that's certainly, it's a factor that people think about when they're considering their careers. Um, Taylor or Norma, do either of you have something you want to contribute to this question? I, I, I would love to in that, you know, the Center for Black Educator Development, we also have a policy and advocacy, um, you know, sphere in which is led by our uh, CEO and our director of external affairs and communications. And one of the things we've done with some of our educational uh, partners is building coalition around policy, right? And, and being instrumental in trying to elevate on a federal level through a bill, right? The increase in teacher salary to a minimum, right? Of at least $60,000 at a starting salary, which, you know, even when I say it out loud, it feels ridiculous. Uh, when you think about all the ways, and, you know, to follow us around the qualifications that we're asking them to have and the invisible tax that this job does, right? This is not simple work. This is not light work. And it's interesting because it's the one area that every other profession has to touch first, right? Like you, these, our babies start off with just little people and they grow up to be the the, the business people and, and, and the infrastructure designers and things like that. And so I think one thing that I, you know, we try to do in practice as an organization and as a former public policy <laughs> major myself, I think one of the biggest things around it is there has to be more coalition and, and unification amongst educational institutions, right? So even when you think about the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools, that should be coming together with public school districts, that should be coming up with, uh, you know, higher ed institutions. Everybody has to come together in a collective impact type of way to say, no matter how we touch this profession, we all agree on one thing, that those who decide to become an educator should be paid accordingly, and they shouldn't have to work two to three jobs to then come and service, right, and be in service to students and families while also trying to provide food for their own, right? That just doesn't feel good. And we are too rich of a nation to allow that to continue to happen with little to no accountability. And so I think that that coalition building is extremely necessary. Yeah, I agree. The coalition is extremely important. And I think that speaks to the work that Paolo's organization does in Minnesota. Um, so I was wondering if, Paolo, you could explain to us a little bit more about e for es theory of change and why you focus your efforts on elevating teacher voice and how that's important to elevating the profession. Absolutely. So our theory of change uh, is is driving two things, uh, eliminate, eliminating education achievement gaps by demographics, across demographics, and also elevating the teaching profession uh, for, for that respect. Uh, our model includes uh, advocacy and organizing work. We have in Minnesota about 2,300 members. We hire organizers uh, on staff who spend their days reaching out to, to teachers to meet with them. Uh, we run policy, um, teacher action teams where teachers meet weekly and they debate an issue and they find, build consensus, figure out what is it that is worrying them. And we go through power mapping, uh, finding who the people who can make those changes are, and then we put them in contact with them. So it, it varies depending on the time of the year. Uh, in the spring, you're gonna see us a lot at the Minnesota Capitol building. Uh, but, you know, in the fall, we're doing a lot of that educating, a lot of, you know, the teacher action team pieces, doing school visits. Um, we also do some work uh, to transform our union so that decisions can be made, not just on behalf of teachers, but also on behalf of students. Uh, there's sadly a lot of uh, policies sometimes in bargaining contracts that are not good for kids and we need to find solutions for those so that then it can work better for, for everybody. So we always encouraging our teachers to, to be a leader in their own building, to speak up, to bring to the public's attention the things that are seen. When I was an E40 member in 2014, I was part of the teacher action team studying teacher diversity in Minnesota. And that was before the coalition to increase 
teachers of color became a thing uh, because teachers are the ones who see the issues first. Uh, there's there's just something about how close they are to the line of fire and they start seeing things like this is what this is this is where this is going and we need to do something to to stop it now some of the big things that we have been working on have been uh the teacher licensure changes in Minnesota one of our members was one of the plaintiffs who sued the the former board of teaching about not being able to get a license after being licensed in Boston um and that fight you know still continues because even now uh, some of those pathways to uh non traditional pathways to licensure continue to be under attack every every single year hmm. could you say a little bit more about the work you're doing on teacher licensure in Minnesota yeah, of course. So um, for a little bit of context, uh, Minnesota to be to become a what is co uh, considered by some to be a highly qualified teacher with a traditional license, you had to be basically someone from Minnesota who went to school in Minnesota, who did student teaching that nobody paid you for in Minnesota. Uh, so it really requires you to be, I will, it's almost like a, a hidden profile of what a teacher in Minnesota would look like. It would have to be someone who didn't need a lot of money, someone who maybe had parents support them. And so what that meant is that as people came from other states to Minnesota, because we, I, I still think this is a great place to live, uh, they could then follow their profession here. Uh, so the the peer teacher licensure created, uh, it eliminated the board of teaching. It created the licensing board that we know as Pelsby. It made the agency work a little closer with, uh, more independent on the licensure, but a little closer to the Department of Education. And what that does is that there's pathways for teachers who have not gone to a teacher prep program uh, either because they're not going to do it um, or they're doing it, but they're not done yet. And it just helps them to meet some criteria so that they can go from a tier one, which is the very basic one, uh, to a tier four license uh, at the end. So someone graduated from a program here uh, will basically become a tier four teacher right away, right after school. Someone pursuing this other, uh, it will almost be about 10 years before they go from beginning to end uh, because it's still a challenge uh, and it still creates a lot of uh, job insecurity because if you have a, teach, a tier one or tier two license, it's because the principal basically has saying there's absolutely nobody with a tier three or tier four that I can hire and therefore I have to do this very early right almost at the start or after the start of the school year. Uh, and that is really draining us from uh, a lot of talent, a lot of opportunities. Uh, we have been talking about teacher diversity. Teacher diversity is something that is not going to change unless we make the profession uh, education to be more affordable and accessible to low-income communities. And many of them are black and brown and, and indigenous students. Uh, mm -hmm candidates for teachers. Thank you for sharing all that. Sounds like really good work that's happening in Minnesota, but still lots more work to be done. Um, and kind of on that note, I have one more question for you all, and then I'm going to open it up to the Q&A from the audience. Um, and in addition to charter schools having more teachers of color, charter schools are also more likely to be led by a person of color. But of course, the process of applying for a charter to open a school is really expensive and complex similar to becoming a teacher in Minnesota. Um, here at the National Alliance, we're currently working on a bill which will provide very small pre-planning grants to support current educators who aspire to run their own schools. And I'm curious if you guys um, could just speak a little bit about what kind of resources you think a current educator would need in order to plan for opening a school that was intentional about being designed and staffed to reflect the student population they intend to serve. So this might be a question for Norma, I guess, to start. It's a lot, right? Like when you're trying to open a school, like is in in the case of, of for us, like we need require specific talent, right? Because in Minnesota, only one percent of of Latino children receive bilingual education. So 
for me to find the right talent, I have to recruit all over the country. And then once I get them into Minnesota, then I have all these roadblocks of like, they're not going to get a license. But I think the, the idea of having just the, the mere idea of having funding to, to really truly plan. I think that's something that 20 years ago when this school started, when when um, El Colegio High School started, they had it, but it was like external funding, was private funding that helped this schools going. And having that, that availability will be huge, right? Like ma making sure that you have all your ducks in a row because that really creates your success in the future years. Schools that don't make it in the first, the best thing that could have done that schools that don't make it to the first, year or two of what their their marks should not continue. I, I agree a hundred percent because you're gonna struggle with that for the rest of your life. Thanks for that, Norma. Um, do either of you have any thoughts on that? Like providing small amount of financial support for current educators who wanna open schools? I, I think that's a wonderful initiative. I think that there should be additional funding for just professional development, though. I think there's so many competing priorities when you think about opening in a school. And a lot of times the professional development is the first thing that's put to the back burner because you're just, to Norma's point, I'm just trying to hire the best human capital I can to support the students. And the reason that the professional development is so important is if we are intentional about having a culture plan, about setting the tone of not only how we will engage with students and families, but how staff will engage with one another. And this comes to one of the questions that we had in the chat, right? How do leaders deal with microaggression and bias? Those things are going to happen because that's human behavior. But you ha that having a plan in place to ensure people have the tools and language necessary to address them when it happens and how to be proactive in their own mindsets and practices from letting it manifest on a consistent basis, that's a retention strategy right there. So all the work that you did to put your staff in the seats to ensure that they stay in those seats, that's why it's just as important to ensure that there is funding in place to support the foundational professional development to really support the culture you are trying to cultivate and foster in the opening of that school to have a strong start from the beginning. And I think a lot of that has to do with cultural proficiency um, work and development. And like Norma said, this is not white people work. This is this is everybody's work because, because race supersedes, right? Culture supersedes race. There's so many other factors to culture. And that's when you really start to get into the sustainability of this profession, even for educators of color, is when you have these tools and resources for school leaders, for executive directors, for everybody um, in a building to have and know how to work across lines of difference, manage and prevent conflict across lines of difference. Because a lot of times, the, the things that people are experiencing in their school buildings that are bringing this conflict and things of that nature aren't having to do with these black and white things that are in our code of conduct, our employee handbooks. They're really cultural differences and practices that are at play that then can really supersede um, the culture of a school and what they're trying to do to move that work for kids. So definitely think that should be thought about with funding. Yeah, and thank you, Taylor. And you also just jump started our Q&A, which I appreciate, which was bringing up this question about bias and microaggression. So for school leaders who are working with a diverse educator workforce, what are some ways they can address this? And you're speaking about, you know, professional development and establishing those norms at the beginning. I'm curious, does Norma, you have anything to add here about how you address bias and microaggressions that may occur in a diverse workspace like a school? One of the things with the high school that we did was um, we asked the students to research, I don't know if you're familiar with WIPAR, Youth Participatory Action Research. And we talked to the students and they come up with the question. So if the students, if we serve mainly students of color, big majority, should only teachers of color should work in our schools? And they researched it, they went and asked teachers, they went and asked students, they, they read articles and their answer back to us was, no, you need a diverse, population of teachers because we're going to go to a, a diverse world right like we need to learn also how to maneuver whiteness and all that stuff but what it made them in common was that they needed to share critical consciousness they needed to be aware of who they were and what they represented in that space that was something that i don't think we're very clear when we're hiring and when we're if we if we could be up the most eloquent like you are here to serve in this purpose and who you are and being very aware of who you are, having that kind of 
staff development where I know as a teacher, my identity affects every student. Otherwise it's just tokenism, right? Like we, we just need black teachers because we have black students. No, we need also the critical consciousness, consciousness that overpasses anything else that that's where we can work in the same goal. Otherwise, all these microaggressions, all these things are going to continue happening because it's human behavior, like Taylor said. Uh, I have a follow-up question here for Taylor. Uh, do you have a go-to best practice, like professional development that you would recommend or that would be, you could say, share turnkey that, um, for training teachers on how to amass that language to address microaggressions at work? Like, is there something you would recommend to school leaders? So without trying to give like free free advertisement here though, but at the center, right? Like part of the work that my team has led and done is actually cultivating these trainings around understanding how, understanding what they are and how to minimize the nuances and tenets of microaggressions. And there is, you know, I would, I would say one, reach out to us. We'd love to have just like an informational conversation with you about how to support your staff. I think in the immediate is one, Looking up, there's, you know, uh, Dr. Su Wong has done an amazing uh, scholarly study around the racial microaggressions. And although they're grounded in race because that is like the number one area where we see that play out in people's identities, that they experience all the three different types of microaggressions that he goes on to talk about are applicable to any identity element or marker that someone can have. And that's a micro insult, a micro assault, right? And a micro invalidation. Just giving people the terminology to know, right? what they're doing is different than you offended me versus I believe that you just committed a micro assault. And I don't think you intended to, but you did. And let me tell you why. That language right there stops people because a lot, nine chances out of 10, they don't know what a micro right <laughs> assault is. And two, you're now taking it off of you, the burden off of you to have to explain that this isn't grounded in my feelings. This is grounded in something that unfortunately white dominant culture says academics have to be, it has to be scholarly sometimes for people to really get that this is real. And that is where I would say to, to start is with having some of those articles read and discussions, um, but then also please reach out to us to offer some PD around it. We also give tools on how to address them in the moment between students to students, teachers to students, et cetera. Great, so it sounds like we can send people your way, Taylor, if they need those trainings on micro questions of micro assault. So thank you for that. Um, one more question. I think this one's for Norma. Um, what best practices would you recommend to attract teacher candidates of color, especially if you're considering a small pool of available um, teacher of color candidates? I, I, like I said, like you're being genuine about the work that you're doing, that you're, the tokenism, we can feel it, we can smell it, we can see it. So as much as you can put it in your websites, as much as you can do that you're doing racial work, we know if you're being tokenized. And sometimes we have to make the decision as teachers of color, if I'm gonna decide to be tokenized this year. And that's how we talk. Am I gonna take this job? I'm gonna be completely tokenized, but it pays more money. We have to make those decisions, but it's, and there's this, right? When they meet with me, I, I do the recruitment, they meet with me and they we have a conversation of what they want to do in life. I don't want to use you just to be here teaching for five years. And what are your goals? How can we help you to go to your goals? Do you want to open a school in 10 years? We'll help you open a school in 10 years. Do you want to be administrator? Do you want to be coach? Do you want to be a counselor, social worker, whatever you want to be? Like we're part of their, their they feel that they're moving, they're progressing. Otherwise, who wants to, there's teachers that say, I want to just teach. Good. Okay. Here's your classroom. But there's people who like, I want to teach for a couple of years and then I want to do these other things. And we're part of that ride with them. So we're, it's genuine. Mentorship is so important that they get mentors that look like them, that bend with them, that like, I have a lot of Latinas, right? Like working with me, it's like, it's normal. I want to do what you're doing. Okay like get in here, right? Like, so it's a different type of relationship when you're you're getting people of color into your buildings that are that are not just, they look good in their website, right? Like, it's just like- So it sounds like the takeaway is be authentic, be real. Be very authentic. I, 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 think, I think people are, especially after the pandemic, they don't wanna work for something or somebody or a leader that is not genuine. Yeah, I see Paolo's trying to jump in here. Uh, they're just saying, Norma, that those are great practices for staff retention in any profession. 
uh, honestly, so thank you for, for sharing those. I, I wish to be managed in that way. <laughs> um, some other things um, that uh, in Richfield Public Schools, where I serve on the board, some of the things that we've done uh, through the years has been to make sure that leaders at the cabinet level are also are black and brown. Uh, because when you bring people to interview, like that's a different experience, even at the interview level of how, oh, this is a place that generally welcomes, you know, black women at the top, uh, Hispanic women being directors of uh, programs. Um, we have also gone to the University of Minnesota to speak to teacher candidates of color. They haven't, they don't have the licenses yet. But we go there and we basically try to persuade them to apply. Like we say, we want you here. Uh, I hope to see your your curriculum, your application in the next few months. Uh, and then at the building level to really work on that psychological safety that allows teachers to do what Taylor uh, so smartly suggested that we do because you don't feel safe. If you think you're going to get fired, if you think you're going to be frowned upon, then you're not going to do it. And then you're just going to uh, share how you feel with your feet as you walk away from that building and move somewhere else. Uh, teacher shortage means that there's different options for teachers to go. And so making sure that they have those uh, opportunities to be themselves and to express themselves without being their responsibility. Because I don't wanna be the one teaching everybody how not to say uh, things that you shouldn't say. But in the case where somebody says something like, you know, then I wanna be able to feel safe uh, sharing it without consequences. Thanks for that, Paula. And um, said, oh, ahead, no, Fiona, I'm sorry. Like, mm -hmm. I want to stress how important it is to have language, common language for these things, for hiring, promoting, microaggressions. That is very clear what we mean by this. When we say we're not going to do this, what does we mean by that? That clarity of very explicit. At Academia Cesar Chavez, we're not allowed to say the N-word by staff, by teachers, by students. We just don't allow it, period. That's it. We have PDs, we talk about it, right? Like, how can we, like, but the language, when we have this, the common language to be able to say, uh, Fiona, with what lens are you looking at that? That's the mm -hmm. kind of language we use, for example. It, I'm not calling you racist. I'm not calling you anything. I just want to know with what lens are you looking at it? Because it can be female, your your gender, your your age, your your situational power, your all the stuff that can throw you off from like making a comment or you, or a decision that you're making. Yeah, thank you, Norman. Thank you for getting that question from the chat there, uh, which is great because now we are at time and I'm sorry to have to cut this off because it's such a rich conversation. Um, but I want to thank everyone who joined us today for this important conversation, especially thank you to our incredible panelists, Paula Cole, Norma Garces, and Taylor Howard for sharing their time and insight with us. You all are brilliant and I'm glad that you're in the powerful positions that you are and I hope that you continue to have your voices elevated. And thank you also to Roberto Rodriguez for joining to share the perspectives of the Department of Education. And to everyone who joined us to listen in today, please keep the conversation going. Join us on social media. Don't hesitate to reach out. Um, this is a really important conversation that can't be had in one hour as is evidenced by us being one minute over. Um, so thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day. And we look forward to seeing you.